Colleagues, good morning to you. Our chaplain today is uh, Pastor Christian Norman. Pastor Norman is the associate pastor at the First Baptist Church of Woodstock, where I've had the privilege of serving as the young adult pastor for the past 14 years. He's one of my bosses, but when you see how big he is in a minute, you'll understand that I'll pretty much do anything he tells me to do, regardless of whether he's my boss or not. Pastor Norman was an outstanding football player in high school and received a full ride scholarship to play football at Michigan State University. He excelled while there, culminating in being the team captain his senior season, honorable mention, all conference, and projected to be picked in the NFL draft somewhere between rounds four and six. Since moving to Georgia, Pastor Norman's favorite football memory has become Michigan State's triple overtime victory over UGA in 2012, which apparently had an outstanding game in. The trajectory, though, of Pastor Norman's life was changed forever when he suffered a serious injury in the Capital One Bowl uh, playing against Alabama at the end of his sophomore season. And God used that injury to uh, draw him into a relationship with himself and a commitment to live for Christ for the rest of his life and really the opportunity to live up to the name that his parents gave him, Christian. After graduating from Michigan State University, uh, Pastor Norman decided to forego the NFL draft and instead attended the Moody Theological Seminary where he earned a Master's in Divinity degree. He was associate pastor at a church in Detroit, Michigan for several years before moving to Woodstock last year to serve as our associate pastor. He's married to Kayla, who was an outstanding athlete herself, having played basketball at the University of Florida. They have two children, Sophia and Christian J. Norman II, who was born just a few days before Christmas a month or so ago, and they affectionately refer to him as Deuce. So join with me, and let's welcome Pastor Christian Norman. Good morning. Thank you all so much for giving me this incredible opportunity to share with you the truth of God's word and what he's put on my heart. I don't think it's lost on anyone that we do live in incredibly divisive times. Uh, just a few ga a days ago in my office, I was talking with a woman. Uh, she's a grandmother, probably in her late 60s, early 70s. And right now, her sons aren't talking to her because she votes differently, so much so that they may not let her see her grandkids. Uh, so what's happening today um, is not just out in the ether. Uh, what's happening today is touching people where it hits the hardest, and that's at home. Uh, so when my friend and colleague Wes uh, came to me and said, hey, would you consider uh, speaking at the state capitol, I wondered what would be a, a timely message? What would be a relevant word for the times in which we live? And he immediately said without hesitation, unity. So when he said that to me, I started to ask the Lord, well, what's a good place in God's word that talks about unity clearly? And immediately the Lord brought to my mind Psalm chapter 133. It's one of my favorite psalms, and it says this. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, namely, life forevermore. This is a short psalm. And like I said before, it's one of my favorite songs because as a pastor, you have to deal with a lot of conflict. And when there's individuals or people, groups in the church that are at odds, I often think to myself how good and pleasant it would be if we could dwell in unity. But why does the psalmist say this? Well, when he talks about how good it is to dwell in unity, he draws a comparison between unity and the oil that runs down the beard of Aaron, who would be the third highest ranking official in the nation of Israel. And he also compares it to the dew that descends from Mount Hermon onto the regions of Zion or Jerusalem. 
So when he describes the goodness and the pleasantness of dwelling in unity, what he has in mind is the kind of unity that sets a person apart. When oil was placed on the head of Aaron, it was to consecrate him as a high-ranking official in the nation of Israel. Not only that, but he also has in mind the kind of unity that produces flourishing. Why? Because when dew descended from Mount Hermon, it would provide the moisture that was necessary for plant life in a hot and dry region of the world. So when brothers, dare I say when a nation dwells in unity, it can set that nation apart. Dare I say that when a nation dwells in unity, it produces flourishing for the people that live in it. But this morning, can I also suggest that the converse is true, that it's not good and it's not pleasant when brothers dwell in disunity, that it's not like the oil that runs down the beard of Aaron, that it's not like the dew that descends from Mount Hermon. Therefore, it does not lead to setting a nation apart, and it does not lead to the people flourishing in it. There was a great leader that existed a while ago. I'm sure all of you are familiar with him. His name is Abraham Lincoln. When he accepted his ascended nomination in the state of Illinois, he gave a speech on June 16th, 1858, and he said that a house divided cannot stand. Well, that great leader borrowed that line from the greatest leader that the world has ever seen, and he lived over 2,000 years ago. And he's the greatest leader that the world has ever seen, not because he bludgeoned his opponents, not because he overthrew political systems by sheer force. He's the greatest leader that the world has ever seen because he came to serve. And in his service, he lived the life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we should have died, but he was raised from the grave three days later and is now exalted to the right hand of the throne of God. And by faith in his name, by faith in his name, do we have restoration. It's by faith in his name that we have peace with God. And watch this, we also have peace with one another. If you hear me say anything on this Wednesday morning, hear me say this. Jesus came so that people could be made right with God and so that people could be made right with one another. Now, what can you do with that? Well, there's uh, two ways that I love for you guys to apply this, both personally and publicly. Uh, personally, this is my encouragement to you. If you have conflict in your life, maybe it's with a spouse, maybe your marriage has been on the rocks, maybe it's with your children, maybe it's with a colleague that sits in this very room, I don't know, wherever there's conflict in your, in your life, would you consider surrendering to the authority of Jesus. Because when you surrender to the authority of Jesus, you all of a sudden have a reason and motivation to get right with other people. I know that when I surrendered my life to Christ almost 10 years ago, when I experienced God's forgiveness, when I experienced God's peace, I was motivated to make phone calls to people that I knew I had offended. I was motivated to tell somebody I'm sorry that our relationship was broken. I was motivated to be reconciled because if I had been reconciled, who am I to withhold reconciliation from somebody else? So if that's you, I'd ask you to consider surrendering your life to Jesus. But then publicly, I recognize that personal piety can't uh, translate into public po uh, policy, but I would say this, learn from the life of Christ. As you all represent your constituents, uh, be an advocate for peace. I'd encourage you practically to assume the best in one another. I'd encourage you all practically to recognize that we have more in common than we have not in common. I'd encourage you all to recognize the need to be reasonable and gentle in your approach, even with those with whom you disagree. And I would encourage you all to recognize that with leadership comes the burden of setting an example. 
in Psalm 133, I don't think it's a mistake that the author described unity in such a way that it always descended. It was like the oil that poured down the head of Aaron. It was like the dew that came down from Mount Hermon. So maybe, just maybe, the author is suggesting that if unity is going to be possible, it must start from the top. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. And Lord God, we thank you that we do have the possibility of unity. When you sent your son, you sent the Prince of Peace. Lord, you made a way not only for people to be reconciled to you, but also so that people could be reconciled to one another. So God, I pray that by your grace and through the power of your spirit, the people in this room will live reconciled lives personally. God, I pray for peace and relationships. God, I pray for things like patience, kindness, forgiveness, and long-suffering. But God, I do also pray for this nation. And Lord God, I do pray for this great state of Georgia. God, I pray that the people in this state and my fellow countrymen at large uh, would be unified. This is a troubling time. It, times it feels like that's not even possible, but there is nothing too hard for you. So God, be gracious to us. Forgive us where we've fallen short. And by all means, help us to walk in unity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.